When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> I totally stopped, uh, forgot to start recording. Hmm. Yes. That, that was a bit of a mistake. Uh, let's see. Do we have any activity? No. No activity. No one. No one loves me. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's see here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just take a look. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Oh. Excellent. Uh, all right. Uh, did you miss the last tale? The one called uh, Children Play at Slaughter. <laughs> uh, that was um that was an interesting story but I dare say uh, the events surrounding it uh, were even more interesting don't know why I, I went over to the uh We'll be back soon, thing. All right, well, I, I sort of spent everything since I got uh, the coffee made a little while ago uh, doing more of a warm-up session, I guess you could say. Um, I figured I would read into the void, into the aether of the internet, and uh, wait until people showed up. And we will go from there. I've got uh, Lucy sharing sharing the event at least. I, we will see if if anybody else shows up. Uh, however, um, I caught about two words of it. All right. Well, I will uh, consider that first half hour, uh, twenty minutes, really. Uh, more of a practice round, I suppose. <clears throat> so, this is one of my very favorite books. It is the original folk and fairy tales of the Bl Brothers Gl Grimm. Um, but this is the first time it was ever translated into English. I think... There we go. I think if people saw more of my hat and less of my messy apartment... I mean, they're still seeing my messy apartment, but what can I do? I can clean my apartment, but... Anyway, um, it is a delightful book. Um, uncensored, unpolished, uh, because when they first wrote this book, they had gone around collecting all these fables, and they basically wrote them down verbatim. Um, or they got their, f their, their people to do it. Uh, as time went on and they made more and more editions of the Brothers Grimm, they prettied them up, uh, made them a little more poetic, I guess you could say, um, gave them better story beats, um, and uh, eventually uh, censored them for uh, the wee little children, since e even to their sensibilities they were a bit gruesome. Um, this doesn't have any of those modifications. These are not your Disney-fied uh, Brothers Grimm stories, and this isn't Grimm's Grimmest like those little collections. This is the full translation of that first edition, and I love it dearly. Uh, some of these stories I haven't read yet. Um, so what I just got done reading, I think is going to be my new go-to to give an example of uh, 
these tales, and it's called, quite simply, it is tale number 22 on page 77 for anybody who has this book and needs to and wishes to follow along. And it is, um, How Some Children Played at Slaughtering. And uh, for those of, of German uh, background, uh, language knowing, I apologize for any mispronunciation I might do. All right. In a city named Franeker, located in West Friesland, some young boys and girls between the ages of five and six happen to be playing with uh, one another. They chose one boy to play a butcher, another boy was to be a cook, and a third boy was to be the pig. Uh, then they selected one girl to be a cook, and another girl to be her assistant. Uh, the assistant was to catch the blood of the pig in a little bowl uh, so that they could make sausages. Well, that sounds that sounds delicious. Uh, as agreed, the butcher now fell upon the little boy playing the pig, threw him to the ground, and slit his throat with a knife. While the assistant cook uh, caught the blood in her little bowl. A councilman was walking nearby and saw this wretched act. Uh, he immediately took the butcher boy with him into the house of the mayor. The mayor, who uh, instantly summoned the entire council, they deliberated about this incident, incident and didn't know what to do with the boy, uh, for they realized it had all been part of a children's game. One of the councilmen, a wise old man, advised the chief judge to take a beautiful red apple in one hand and a Rhenish gold coin in another. Then he was to call the boy and stretch out his hands to him. If the boy took the apple, he was to be set free. If he took the gold coin, he was to be killed. The judge took the wise man's advice, uh, and the boy grabbed the apple with a laugh. Thus, he was set free without any punishment. Huh. Uh, so... My theory as to the judgment call was uh, if he took the apple, he was just an innocent little boy who wanted to do uh, play and be an innocent little kid. Uh, if he took the gold coin, then he was already tainted by the sin of greed, and therefore it was premeditated murder and he should die. Uh, that, that's, that's my takeaway from all this. I, I, your mileage may vary. Um, there is a second version of this tale. Um, there was once a father who slaughtered a pig, and his children saw that. Uh, in the afternoon, when they began playing, one child said to the other, You be the little pig, and I'll be the butcher. He then took a shiny knife and slit his little brother's throat. Their mother was upstairs in a room bathing uh, her, another child, and when she heard the cries of her son, uh, she immediately ran downstairs. Upon seeing what had happened, she took the knife out of her son's throat and was so enraged that she stabbed the other boy in the heart, who had been playing the butcher. Then she quickly ran back to the room to tend to her child in the bathtub. But while she had been gone, he had drowned in the tub. Now the woman became so frightened and desperate that she wouldn't allow the neighbors to comfort her, and finally hung herself. When her husband came back from the field and saw everything, he became so despondent that he died soon thereafter. Cheerful! Perfect bedtime story. Don't play at your father's craft, kids. Your mother might commit suicide. Uh, here is one of the lovely pieces of art um, that has rather dark implications in in here. So yes, that is an example of a Brothers Grimm tale in its originality.
I'm so very much going to uh, include that in my next fairy tale compilation, I believe. Uh, now, uh, that one many call Behead, uh, share the stream on Twitter for you. Oh, excellent. Right? It's so cheerful. Children playing games and uh, killing each other. Mothers committing suicide after they stab their child in the heart. Oh, it is just coffee. I woke up literally at about uh, 5.40 uh, p.m. and had to rush to get the stream going. So this is my morning. This is my 7.13 a.m., except it's uh, not the a.m. So that was the Brothers Grimm. In fact, I think I'm going to find another selection in here. Um, I rather like the morbidity of uh, original fairy tales. Hello, Jimmy Cricket. Loved the live stream a few days ago. All right, let's see here. Uh, wolf and some kids. Nightingale, storm pants, a hand with a knife. Uh, okay. Oh, that one. Hmm. Uh, Hansel and Gretel. Uh, I fix it up. Red snake. Uh, Fishman's wife. Story of the Brave Tailor. Cinderella. Hmm. Chilling blades. Swallowed. Slaughtered. Yeah, three ravens. Little red cap. Uh, uh, maiden without hands. For the hounds, puss and boots. There are a lot of good, good <laughs> options in here. Uh, uh, what about bridegroom? Oh, Godfather, strange feast. Uh, let's see here. I am also, oh, also uh, open to any uh, recommendations, provided you know they're legal recommendations and not something that's going to get me kicked off the stream. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Little Snow White, simple Hans, Rumple Stiltskin. Bluebeard. Oh. Where was... Ah, uh, there was one that I read a long time ago that was particularly good. Uh, volume 2. Poor Man and the Rich Man. Hello, Nola. Let's go back to the beginning. Oop. Pushy cat, being pushy. You'll do. Imagine Mary Sandal. The wolf. The wolf and seven kids. Oh, that sounds interesting. Let's try that one. Three. There we are. The wolf and seven kids. Oh, it's the Billy Goat's Gruff. Well, no, that was a troll. Oh, well. Uh, well, let's see. A goat had seven young kids, whom she loved very much and carefully protected from the wolf. Uh, one day, when she had to go and fetch some food, she called them all together and said, Dear children, I must go out and find some food. So be on your guard against the wolf, and don't let him inside. Pay close attention, because he often disguises himself. But you can recognize him right away by his gruff voice and black paws. Protect yourselves. If he gets into the house, he'll eat you all up. Upon saying this, the goat went on her way. But it was not long before the wolf arrived at the door and called out, Open up, dear children. I'm your mother, and have brought you some beautiful things. If you see me shifting, I have a cat in my lap. Um, but the seven kids said, You're not our mother. She has a lovely soft voice, and yours is gruff. You're the wolf, and we're not going to open up this door. The wolf went away to a shopkeeper and bought a big piece of chalk, which he ate and it made his voice soft. Then he returned uh, 
to the house. Then he returned to the house door of the seven kids and called out with a soft voice, Dear children, let me in. I'm your mother, and I've brought something for each of you. But the wolf had put his paw on the window sill, and when the children saw it, they said, You're not our mother. She doesn't have black paws like yours. You're the wolf. We're not going to open the door for you. So the wolf ran off to the baker and said, Baker, put some dough on my paws for me. And after that was done, the wolf went to the miller and said, uh, Sprinkle some white flour on my paws. The miller said, No. If you don't do it, I'll eat you up. So the miller had to do it. Well, that's a fairly reasonable transaction. Uh, now the wolf went once again to the house door of the seven kids and said, Dear children, let me in. I'm your mother, and I've brought something for each of you. The seven kids wanted to see the paws first, and when they saw that they were snow white and heard the wolf speak so softly, they thought he was their mother and opened the door. Once the wolf entered, uh, however, they recognized him and quickly hid themselves as best as they could. The first kid slid under the table, the second hid in the bed, and the third in the oven the fourth in the kitchen, and the fifth in the cupboard, the sixth under the large wash basin, and the seventh in the clock case. However, the wolf found them all and swallowed them up, except for the youngest in the clock case, who remained alive. When the wolf had satisfied his craving, he went off. Shortly thereafter, the mother goat came home, and oh, what a terrible sight. The wolf had been there and had devoured her dear children, she thought they were all dead, but then the youngest jumped out of the clock case and told her how everything had happened. In the meantime, the wolf, who was stuffed, had gone to a green meadow where he had lain himself down in the sun and fallen into a deep sleep. The old goat thought she still might be able to save her children. Therefore, she said to, her young to the youngest kid, Take the scissors, needle, and thread, and follow me. After she left the house, uh, she found the wolf lying on the ground in the meadow, snoring. There's that nasty wolf, she said, and inspected him from all sides. There he is, after eating my children for supper. Give me the scissors. Oh, if only they're still alive inside him. Because everybody knows, in fairy tales, uh, you just swallow people whole. You don't chew. No 26 times. Uh, then she cut his belly open, and the six kids that had, been allowed, that had been swallowed whole by the gluttonous wolf jumped out and were unscathed. Probably traumatized. Immediately, she ordered them to gather large and heavy stones to bring them to her. Then she filled his stomach with them, and the kids sued him up again and hid behind a hedge. When the wolf had finished sleeping, he felt his stomach was very heavy and said, Oh, it's rumbling and tumbling in my belly. It's rumbling and tumbling in my belly, and I've only eaten six kids. He thought he had better have a drink of fresh water to help himself, and he looked for a well. But when he leaned over, he couldn't stand straight because of the stones and fell into the water. When the seven kids saw this, they came running and danced joyfully around the well. The end. Well, uh, Reaper's Horror, the one in the oven uh, didn't want to go raw. <laughs> uh, so in that one, uh, apparently wolves swallow their their uh, meals whole when they get too enthusiastic. Um, a mother and her children are good at uh, stomach surgery, and um, that doesn't kill wolves, but the drowning does. Yes. All right. Uh, earlier I opened up with an old favorite. 
It is not quite as morbid, but it is a fun one. Um, being from the uh, frigid north of Alaska, I once worked on a train, or rather my host body did, and I would recite a delightful classic poem that maybe you've heard. It's fairly popular, but it's by one Robert Service. After this, I might get into some Lovecraft. That should be interesting. Um, so yes, uh, collected poems of Robert Service. I even have the bookmark for the bookstore that I bought this book from. Tidal Wave Books. If you end up in um, Anchorage, Alaska, you will you could find that. They are effectively the... Uh, uh, I think they are the largest used bookstore in Alaska. Um, and when you're up in the cold, white north... Uh, there's very little to do, but plenty of reading. All right. This is called The Cremation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge, I cremated Sam McGee. Now Sam McGee was from Tennessee, where the cotton blooms and blows, why he left his home in the south to roam round the pole God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell. Though he'd often say in his homely way, he'd sooner live in hell. On a Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold through the Parker's fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes we'd close, then the lashes froze till sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. At that very night, as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed and the stars o'erhead were dancing heel and toe, he turned to me and, Cap, says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking that you uh, won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he says with a sort of moan, Oh, it's this cursed cold, and it's got right hold till I'm chilled clean through to the bone. Yet taint being dead, it's uh, my awful dread of the icy grave that pains. So I want you to swear, foul or fair, that you'll create cremate my last remains. Well, the pal's last need is a thing to heed. So I swore that I would not fail. And we started on at the peak, at the streak of dawn, but God, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched on the sleigh and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee. And before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death, and I hurried, horror driven with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh, and it seemed to say, You may tax your broad and brains, but you promise true, and it's up to you to cremate those last remains. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were dumb, in my heart how I cursed that load. In the long, long night, by the lone firelight, while the huskies, round in a ring, held out their woes to the homeless snows. Oh, God, how I loathe that thing. And every day that quiet clay seemed to heavy and heavier grow. And on I went, though the dogs were spent and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad and I felt half mad, but I swore I would not give in. And I'd often sing to that hateful thing, and it hearkened with a grin. Till I came to the marge of Lake Labarge, and a derelict there lay, 
It was jammed in the ice, but I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May. And I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and I looked at my frozen chum. Then, here, said I, with a sudden cry, is my crematorium! Some planks I tore from the cabin floor, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying around, and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, and the furnace roared, such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike, for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. And the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And the greasy smoke in an inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear, but the stars came out and they danced about ere again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peep inside. I guess he's cooked and it's time I looked. And then the door I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile you could see a mile, and he said, Please, close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you'll let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plumtree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. That would make <clears throat> the Arctic trail <laughs> trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The Northern Lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge. I cremated Sam McGee. Once upon a time, I had that memorized. To be fair, I was also taking, I was also uh, bartending on a train between Anchorage and Fairbanks, so there were about uh, many, many hours of downtime to do so. And that is the cremation of Sam McGee, a classic. I have a collection of Edgar Allan Poe, I have a collection of H.P. Lovecraft, a generic collection of horror stories, and then of course there's always uh, creepypastas and the like. So any requests, uh, I will happily do, uh, provided that they um, are acceptable. So no, um, no penthouse letters or anything like that. Oh yes, uh, Robert Service was an excellent poet. Um, did a lot of storytelling poetry, uh, so you can probably uh, understand why I am fond of him. In fact, it's probably say uh, he is my biggest influence in now that I think of it in the structure of uh, my poems, um, the whisper of nightmares and um, uh, the tale of Mister Twist. Him and probably Doctor Seuss. <laughs> Without the Seussian rhymes. All right. Let's see if we have anybody new. Uh, Commander Root, Rafter Man 23. I did not catch sight of you last time. Oh, dear. My background is horrible. Uh, where is my... Oh, there it is. Uh, oh, no, no, that's it. Okay. Well, fine. All right. So, uh, I guess I will do... Since I tend to have a reputation for doing Lovecraft. I'll do something from Lovecraft. I'm going to do a short one. Lovecraft is wordy. I am going to stumble over my words quite a bit. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we will start with a classic. Uh, Dagon. It's on page 23. God, this is a big book. Pretty book. 
I like it. Only had a slight marring on the cover, so they knocked off a whole bunch of prices from it, so... My cheap butt. I've got a pilot here. You can't really see her too well, but there she is. This is Nala. Alright. And no, Reapers, you cannot eat her. If this quarantine goes on any longer, though, I might. Kidding, kidding. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. Dagon by H.P. Lovecraft. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer. I shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I, have, I must have forgetfulness or death. It was one of it was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation so that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. So liberal indeed was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water uh, and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. That is a little louder than I care for. Well, that's about as quiet as it's going to get, apparently. Oh, there we go. When at last I awaked, it was to discover my, myself half-sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. For there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. 
Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of this, of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions which, for innumerable millions of years, had lain hidden under unfathomable, unfathomable, I can speak, watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me, that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean strain my ears as I might. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease, the odor, the odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock uh, which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I first espied it. But the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance, an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost, 
and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by impulse, which I cannot definitely an analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath... Pardon? I scrambled on the, with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath gazing... <clears throat> How to get that sentence right. <laughs> I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath. Gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me, an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone I soon assured myself but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near its zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, <clears throat> across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was, it was the pictorial carving, however, that did the most to hold me spellbound. Plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas-reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men. Though the creatures were shoon disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage to of some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer, they were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet. Shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. 
Curious enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. For one of the creatures was shewn in the act of killing a whale represented as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of a primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then suddenly I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid, in, slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, poly polythemus-like, and loathsome, it darted a stupendous it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms. And while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds, I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached my boat. At any rate, I know that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest of moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by the captain of an American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. Nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon such a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarded, regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease, and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all. Having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men, Often I ask myself if I could not all have been, uh, if it could not all have been a pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man-of-war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering, of the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near. 
I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. Oh God, that hand. The window! The window! And that was Dagon by H.P. Lovecraft. And I'm almost done with this copy. Ooh. My nose started to itch towards the end. It was very uncomfortable. I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, let's see if we have anybody new. Mm-hmm. Hal Halu Halu H A L I W underscore. Well, welcome. I hope you enjoyed what you caught of that story. I will need a refill. Uh, one moment. Anybody else? Okay. I can go ahead and close that that way. Facebook uh, chats won't um <laughs> won't pop into the middle of my my cosmic horror stories. Oof, lukewarm. Oh, well. That's the joy of a French press. All right. So, um... Again, I have Lovecraft. I have Poe. You know, let's let's break it up a bit. We'll do some Poe. Poe, unfortunately, has the misfortune of being the outermost book on my display shelf. <laughs> um, which means it is also the book that the furballs rub up against most often. With that in mind, I am thinking... The Black Cat might be an excellent story to start off with. It's only 10 pages, I, I could do that. Yes, yes, Black Cat 83. Oh, come on. I don't read much Poe, I really should though. That rhymed. All right. Uh, I should probably take advantage of the fact that the chair has got to be back. A little closer here. I hope the music isn't uh, 
distracting. I like to think it works very well for classic horror. Alright. <clears throat> it's been a long time since I've read this, so I'll try to uh, not stumble as much as I might. The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe. For the most wild yet homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence, yet mad I am not. And very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow I die, and today I would unburden my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world, plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, and have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. To many, they will seem less terrible than Baroque. Hereafter, perhaps some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace, some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own which will perceive in the circumstances I detail with awe, nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my infancy I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals, and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time, and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of character grew with my growth, and in my manhood I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature of or the intensity of the gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere men. I married early and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, of rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This later was a remarkable, large, and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon this point, and I mention the matter at all for no better reason than that it happens just now to be remembered. Pluto, that was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me wherever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. 
Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend in temperance, had, I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew day by day more moody, more irritable, more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife, and length I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when by accident or through affection they came in my way. But my disease grew upon me, for what disease is like alcohol? And at length even Pluto, who was now becoming old and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effect of my ill temper. One night, returning home much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him when, in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish, fiendish malevolence, gin nurtured, thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat, and deliberately cut out one of its eyes from its socket. I blush, I burn, I shudder while I pen the damnable atrocity. What reason returned with mourning when I had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch. I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse, for the crime of which I had been guilty. But it was, at best, a feeble, equivocal feeling, and the soul remained untouched. I again plunged into excess and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat recovered. The socket of the lost eye... Uh, the socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance. But he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but as might be expected fled in extreme terror at my approach. I had so much of my old heart left as to be first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of the creature which had once so loved me. But this feeling soon gave place to irritation, and then came as if to my final and irrevocable overflow. The spirit of perverseness of this spirit, philosophy takes no account. Yet I am not more sure that my soul lives than I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart. One of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which give direction to the character of man. Who is not a hundred times found himself committing a vile or a silly action? For no other reason than because our best judgment oh whoops for no other reason than because he knows he should not. Have we not a perpetual inclination 
in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law, merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable, unfathomable longing, I can speak honest, <clears throat> of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for the sake, uh, for wrong's sake only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning, in cool blood, I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree. Hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse at my heart. Hung it because I knew that it had loved me, because I felt it had given me no reason of offense, hung it because I knew that in so doing I was committing a sin, a deadly sin, that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it, if such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite, infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God. On the night of the day on which this cruel deed was done, I was aroused from sleep by the cry of fire. The curtains of my bed were in flames. The whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that, that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete. My entire worldly wealth was swallowed up, and I resigned myself thenceforward in despair. I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity. But I am detailing a chain of facts, and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house, and against which had rested the head of my bed. The plastering had here in great measure resisted the action of, of, of the fire. Hmm. Itchy nose. A fact which I attributed to its having been recently spread. About this wall a dense crowd were collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it which very, with very minute and eager attention. The words strange and singular and other sim similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw, as if graven in bas relief upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvelous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme, for I could scarcely regard it as... <clears throat> but at length, but at length, reflection came to my aid. 
The cat, I remembered, had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd, uh, by someone of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my bedchamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of the walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of freshly spread, spread plaster, the lime of which, uh, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, uh, had then accomplished the portrait, uh, the portraiture, as I saw it. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling fact just detailed, it did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months, I could not rid, rid myself of the phantasm of the cat. During this... Uh, and during this period, there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed but was not remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal, and to look about me among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented for another pet of the same species, and of somewhat similar appearance, with which to supply its place. One night, as I sat half stupefied in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin, or of rum, which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had not sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and closely resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white, covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon touching him, he immediately arose, purring loudly, rubbed against my hand, and apparently delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it from the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never even seen it before. I continued my caresses, and when I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and petting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once, and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my part, I soon found a dislike to it rising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated, but I know not how or why it was. It, its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed me. By slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it. 
I did not, for some re weeks, strike or otherwise violently ill-use it, but gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing, and to flee silently from its odious presence as from the breath of a pestilence. What added, no doubt, to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that, like Pluto, it also had been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I have already said, possessed in a high degree that humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait and the source of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a, a pertinacity which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I rose to walk, it would get between my feet and thus nearly throw me down. Or, fastening its long, sharp clay claws in my dress, clamber in this manner to my breast. And at such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from doing so. Partially, by memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it all at once, by my absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet I should be at a loss how otherwise to define it. I am almost ashamed to own, yes, even in this felon's cell, I am almost ashamed to own that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired within me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair of which I have spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which, for a long time, my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness, a distinct outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name, and for this, above all, I loathed and dreaded, and would have rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, of the gallows. O oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and of crime, of agony and of death, And now was I indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity. And a brute beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed. My God, so much of insufferable woe. <laughs> Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former, the creature left me no imminent, uh, no moment alone. And in the latter, I started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing on my face. 
and its vast weight, an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off, incumbent eternally upon my heart. Beyond the pressure of torments such as these, the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my sole intimates, the darkest and most evil of thoughts. The moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind. While from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outbursts of a fury to which I now blindly abandoned myself, my uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers. One day, she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the steep stairs and, nearly throwing me headlong, exasperated me to madness. Uplifting an axe and forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand, I aimed a blow for the animal, which, of course, would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife. Goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoniacal, I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot, without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished, I set f myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one period I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by the fire. At another I resolved to dig a grave in for it in the floor of the cellar. Again I deliberated about casting it into the well in the yard and about packing it in a box as if merchandise with the usual arrangements and so getting a porter to take it from the house. Finally, I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. I determined to wall it up in the cellar, as the monks of the Middle Ages are recorded to have walled up their victims. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed and had been plastered throughout, throughout with a rough plaster which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection caused by a false chimney or fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I made no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the whole thing up before, so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. And in this calculation I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar I easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position, while with little trouble I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand, and hair with every possible precaution, I prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old, and with this, I carefully went over the new brickwork. When I had finished, 
I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, Here, at least then, my labor has not been in vain. My next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had at length firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with it at that moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate, but it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger, and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe, uh, or <clears throat> it is impossible to describe or imagine the deep, the blissful sense of relief which its absence, uh, which the absence of the detestable creature, occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus, for one night at least since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and the third day passed, and still my tormentor came not. Once again I breathed as a free man. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. My happiness... Er, some few inquiries had been made, uh, but these had been readily answered. Even a search for my... Even a search had been instituted, but of course nothing had, was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of the police came, very unexpectedly, into the house, and proceeded again to make a rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure, however, in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatsoever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered, not in a muscle. My heart beat calmly as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee at my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say if but one word by way of triumph and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Gentlemen, I said at last, as the party ascended the steps, I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen, this, this is a very well-constructed house. In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say an excellently well-constructed house. These walls are... Are you, are you going, gentlemen? These walls are very solidly put together. And here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily with a cane, which I held in my hand upon the very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the archfiend. No sooner 
had the reverberation of my blows sunk into the silence, and I was answered by a voice from within the tomb. By a cry, at first muffled and broken, like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman. A howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror, half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony and of the demons that exult in the damnation. Of my own thoughts, it was folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless. Through extremity of terror and of awe. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall and fell bodily. The corpse already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder, and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up within the tomb. The end. That was The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe. If H.P. Lovecraft is the father of modern horror, Edgar Allan Poe is the grandfather. That is a non-gene pool, to say the least. Oh. <clears throat> Don't touch your face, Catter. We must learn not to touch our faces. I have been isolated for days. I have washed my hands and body thoroughly. I, I don't know how I could contract um, anything. I think I'm okay. I think. Um, that said, it is getting a little maddening here, to say the least. Mm. I oddly do not remember murder being in that story. What a nice surprise. Yes, there's actually a um, wonderful uh, film representation of this particular tale. Uh, it was from the Masters of Horror um, series. Uh, I think it was season one. I thought it was an okay representation. It was a little... I mean, it was a TV show, so the budget wasn't exactly the best, but uh, they gave a lot of um, great horror directors free reign to do what they wished in their films. I believe the only thing, the only restricted they, restriction they had, at least in season one, um, was that uh, they could have no child-on-child -child violence. I could do anything else, but no child-on-child -child violence. Um, I think they received more restrictions in Season 2. Um, and then that show eventually morphed into the show, I want to say, Fear Itself, uh, which had more restrictions, but still had the whole classic thing of getting uh, horror directors to more or less do whatever the hell they wanted. Uh, just had a little more um, rules for them to follow. Uh, but there was no, like, producer guidance beyond that. Um, at least that's my understanding of it. Um, good show. Unfortunately, my, my DVDs of that show purchased in the long, long ago of 2007 or 8 um, are still up in Alaska. 
Sorry, a little bit of rambling about nonsense, namely because, um, whew, that was, a that was a longer story than I've ever read, um, live. Uh, there's also actually an interesting mask of Poe I saw that has a black cat, a raven, and a heart sculpted into his hair. Hmm. That is quite interesting. Hmm. Okay. And pretty soon, I will need um, and take up the briefest of breaks. I am still here. Uh, let's see here. I have got to uh, open recent. I'm going to open that. <laughs> I'm just doing a quick uh, graphical change here. Uh, let's see. Eight thirty nine. I have some of the Masters of Horror DVDs. I loved tr the trading cards that came with some. Oh, I did not get those. Um, I, I, I wound up collecting the box set. Uh, so I had two really cool box sets. One was in the shape of a skull. Uh, the other was a little less nifty. It was a, a box that was in the shape of a tomb. Um, I really loved the fair-haired child. Um, maybe, maybe the child on child violence was in a second one. Maybe it was after Jennifer, because I remember Jennifer. I did not like Jennifer, personally. Um, let's see here. Uh, the fair-haired child I loved. Um, there is one that took place... Uh, on the ocean, uh, that was like a, a Japanese horror film. Um, I can't remember if another one was called Cigarette Burns, but it featured a, a forbidden film, and it had um, uh, it had the actor from uh, The Walking Dead and Boondock Saints, Norman Reedus. It had him in it, I believe. Um, there are a few good ones. Those movies were very hit and miss, I have to say. I really liked them. I loved having the box set. I miss it dearly. I have to send um, funds up to a friend and have them send me down the box. Uh, oh, that's right. I was going to take a brief um, break. Uh, I want to stay... That and image uh, back soon. Hmm. 
Wait a minute. Where did streaming start soon? Uh, where? Where did where did I export that to? Um, taking a break. Where did I? Oh, well, of course. Uh, recently used. Finalized. There we go. That's why I can't find it. Okay. Now it should be there. Boom. Sorry, doing this as I go. I apologize. Um. All right. You'll add. How do you put caption?
Oops. And here I was thinking I had muted the mic. Well, thankfully nobody actually heard anything disturbing, I hope. Okay, so I didn't get tea just yet, but I have quiche, because um, it's technically my version of 9 a.m., so breakfast. I will try not to chew loudly. Now, we need to figure out what our next story is. I'm thinking a creepypasta. So we've done Lovecraft, we've done some uh, Poe, we've, we've, don't knock that over, uh, we've done some, some service, and we've done, oh, uh, wiki, and we've done, oh, what was the other one? Oh, Brothers Grimm, yes, we did Brothers Grimm. So, I think next up shall be a creepypasta. You heard screams, but scientists. <laughs> Very much, you won't say anything. Um, Cigarette Burns was definitely the name of the Norman Reedus one. Um, I want to say that was Clive Barker's contribution. I could be wrong. I now uh, that that political one you didn't like was that blatantly political because I do remember there was one that involved like politicians and I think cannibalism or something like that. I, I it's been so many years since I've seen those. 
none of you all need to watch me eat. I will switch over to... Hmm. This one? Yeah, sure. That way you can see that I'm talking, but you won't have to watch me eat. I know some people uh, can't stand that sort of thing, so... do we still have in chat? Who have I chased away with these sounds? Yeah, it looks like the same group of people. Wonderful. Um, all right, so uh, let's see here. I've got Creepypasta Wikia up. Um, they have a... Creepypasta Showcase. Alright, let's get a little bit of um, audience participation. Uh, first, let me make sure that none of these are, like, hours of narration time. Or heavily dialogue-rich. I don't mind a little dialogue in my uh, live readings, but it... it uh, can be off-putting to come up with these things on the, with voices on the fly. Uh, okay. No, that's not so... Hmm. Well, that's not so bad. I could do that one. We'll say, um, call me a heathen. I mean, I am. Uh, is that zombie soldiers coming back to do a protest vote against war on terrorism. Oh, yes, I remember that. Yeah, I, uh, God, that was bad. Oh, uh, it was, it, it was, it was like, um, don't get me wrong, I don't mind a, a well done political message or philosophical message in my horror, I mean, uh, that's, 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 uh, you have the classic zombie movies talking about consumerism, literally, um, but, uh, there's, there's, Analogy? I think that's the word I'm looking for. And then there's ham-handedness. And that one was definitely one of the ones I considered a uh, dull show. There was one of them that was funny as hell. Oh, the Deer Woman. Did you ever see the Deer Woman? Absurdist horror comedy, perhaps. Um, the Deer Woman is absolutely hilarious. Uh, it is very much a horror comedy, uh, but it was very, very well done. I think I know which one I'm going to do next.
Kiś, kiś, kiś. I've been very fortunate. I have um, friends who work in places of food. Um, and, and some have delivered me some tasty food and subsequently um, while practicing social distancing um, and subsequently uh, <clears throat> kept me from having to go to the grocery store as often as I otherwise would. Did you ever see the fair-haired child? That was, that one had Lori Petty, otherwise known as Tank Girl, in it. Um, and it was, uh, it was personally my favorite of uh, season one. But, I highly recommend it. Um. Okay. So, bear with me. <clears throat> I have never once read this particular one, and creepy pastas uh, can be hit and miss when it comes to uh, punctuation, dialogue, etc. So, this will be an experiment! I'm going to switch back over since now nobody has to watch me eat, at least for the time being. But take a bite, I'll walk it. Uh, my favorite was from um, from season one was the Lovecraft story. I think the director died recently. Oh yes, yes, uh, he did. He did um, uh, until the most recent Lovecraftian film came out, uh, Color Out of Space. He was pretty much. The only guy uh, doing Lovecraft films, he did Dagon, which was actually um, uh, based more on Innsmouth um, than the Dagon story I, I told. Um, he also did uh, oh, two 80s ones. There was Reanimator, and there was... From beyond, I think. But yes, while there were um, other films to do, uh, uh, shows that did light, uh, Lovecraft, I think Night Gallery did a bunch of Lovecraft uh, stories. Um, he was the only director for a while who was doing actual Lovecraft um, stories uh, with anything amounting to a budget. <laughs> Alright, so I am going to narrate a creepypasta I found in the uh, pasta showcase over at creepypastafandom.com the creepypasta wiki. Uh, theoretically, these are all released under Creative Commons. Um, I, I try to avoid uh, creepypasta.com unless it's uh, something from their OK for Narrations uh, section, which is a deeply hidden tag, by the way. Um, until, unless I can, you know, get a, a direct, um, direct permission. So, <clears throat> this is called Since When Do Mannequins Bleed? By Bloody Spaghetti. That bastard Manny woke me up again in the middle of the night. I absolutely hate it when he does this. This time, I guess he had a good reason to wake me up like that. I just wish he wasn't an asshole about it. Manny and I, we have a strange relationship, I'd say. Even our meeting was weird. He just appeared at my place one day. He was there, sitting on my couch, reading my copy of Dan Brown's Demons and Angels. 
I'll admit this much, his appearance at my place wasn't random at all. I, I can swear I've seen him looking at me as if admiring me from a distance for weeks before meeting. Uh, it's hard to miss the guy. He sticks out like a thorn in a crowd side, given his odd-looking head. Manny's appearance is mostly unremarkable, other than what appears to be a pale, white, smiling mask permanently fused to the skin of his head. Uh, it looks like he has a purposefully deformed mannequin head stuck on his body. Hence the name, Manny. <clears throat> Somehow, no one has, no one else has ever noticed him. Uh, usually, people write me off as mental, however, uh, whenever I mention him, uh, which is why I avoid talking about him to others. When I saw him sitting on my couch like he owned the damn thing, my instinctive reaction was to get mad, which is why I avoid talking about him to, uh, oh, whoops, sorry. <clears throat> I yelled something obscene and pounced on the couch with the intent to maul him with my hands. What came next scared the living hell out of me. I hit the couch and flipped it over, but the bastard was gone. Uh, he disappeared on me before reappearing behind me and letting out his distinctive high-pitched -pitch chuckle of his. He said that he was going to play me like a marionette and then vanished again. I just sat there, flat on my ass, scared out of my wits. I had no clue what the hell had just happened to me. I'm still not entirely sure. It's been years now, and Manny comes and goes. Whenever he shows up, I know it'll be one heck of a ride. Uh, he pops up and does his best to make my life hell. Uh, not letting me sleep by being an incredibly loud, unwanted roommate, or by driving me nuts with his mostly moronic rants just before I go to sleep. Uh, other times, he shows up and just makes me feel like shit by giving me vivid accounts of horrible things about me and the world. Uh, his recollections feels as if he's feeding the imaginary, uh, the imagery, directly into my brain. I can quite see the horrors he's speaking of. <laughs> Needless to say, uh, that makes me feel terrible. Uh, I was on the wrong. I think he can even influence my dreams at this point. I swear whenever I have a nightmare, I wake up to him standing at the edge of my bed, staring straight into my soul. Usually, these nightmares, I... Uh, usually, these nightmares I think he gives me are events from my past. Amplified and perverted into haunting scenes straight out of some horror flick. Other times, these nightmares are just distressingly weird things you'd not expect to see in your sleep. Like that one time when he made me dream of me viewing black and white footage of what appears... Uh, the main street of some city devoid of people with this dramatic music playing in the background. The atmosphere of this whole thing felt incredibly off, uh, but then came the truly terrifying part. Singing, uh, quite a cheerful singing, came to flood my ears, uh, forcing me to look around for the source of the sound. My dream self looked up, and above it, uh, me, hung women, dressed in twenties outfits, swinging from the streetlights, lifeless, swaying softly in the wind, and yet singing cheerfully. I woke up in a cold sweat to be greeted by the pallid mug of that bastard. Over the years, he'd pull some nasty trick where he'd uh, stand there in the distance, making sure I see him before pulling out a long black rod and, and stabbing himself. Somehow, uh, as, in, as if with some voodoo magic, I'd feel it whenever he stabbed himself, uh, usually in the leg. 
and hurt so bad whenever he does this. He seems to have this gleeful expression on his face, like he's enjoying the pain while I want to scream as a result of the sensation of boiling hot metal rods slicing through my nerves. The first time was as shocking as hell. I've bitten so hard through my lip due to the pain, I now have a scar there as a reminder of that day. Unfortunately, I've come to accept it as part of my experience with Manny. <laughs> That's not even the worst of it. The worst part w about Manny, however, isn't this sort of stuff. <sighs> the worst part is when he pops out of nowhere, lets out a thunderous roar straight into my earlobe, before vanishing again. Whenever he does this, I tense up like crazy. It's akin to having a cannon shot going off right next to you. Sometimes I stay tensed up for hours, others it goes away within minutes. After each encounter with Manny, regardless of what he does, I end up being stressed, uh, vigilant, and aggressive, and above all else, exhausted. Sometimes to the point of wanting to just throw myself off somewhere high. That's definitely affected me in more ways than one, hence why I mostly isolate myself from others. He's trying to ruin my life, I'm sure. I, I don't know why me. I didn't do anything wrong. I've always loved helping people. I didn't put on the uniform for the pay. I, I only ever wanted to do some good, you know? The closest I could be to being a superhero, I, I guess. Well, I was sure he was trying to mess with me up until tonight. This time it was different. He woke me up by shaking my body awake. Seeing his ugly mug before even fully waking up gave me that adrenal kick, and I punched him square in the head. Although my fist never connected, it went straight through his head. Hey, hold up, doll! He yelled as I pulled my hand backward, cursing under my breath. I'm here to help you, he continued. I didn't believe him. He was just trying to mess with me again, I reasoned. So I tried ignoring him and going back to sleep. I shrugged him off, pulled the blanket tightly over my head, and he shook me again. Oi, Dolly, get up. It's time here to... It is time I'm here to help. Oh my god, is this supposed to be an accent? Oi, Dolly, get up. This time I'm here to help. Pinky promise. Fuck off. <laughs> Fuck off. I want to say that in, in a bad Irish accent. Fuck off. Or Scottish accent. Huh. No, Irish. Uh, oh, whatever, whatever. I'm, I'm terrible with these accents. Please forgive. Uh, Fuck off. I barked, trying to drown his presence out of my head with some pleasant memories. Shh! They'll hear you. He shushed me. Something was wrong about that statement. Usually there are no others involved in his cruel jokes. I pulled the blanket from my head and looked him dead into his empty eye marks. What are you talking about? He mouthed, Quiet down your tone. Huh? I questioned, confused and genuinely pissed off at this point. There... Oh, Jesus, it is an accent. Mm. Uh, Alright, new H's, new R's, and there are tree mannequins in your house. They don't mean no good, Dolly. He whispered. Bullshit! I barked back with a whisper. I didn't even know why I was whispering, really. Listen to yourself, Dolly. Manny hissed, pointing at where his ears should have been. I did as he said. It was dead silent. 
I was going to throw another fit at that creature that's been haunting me for the last few years, but then my thought process was cut short by the sounds of footsteps. Two. Four. Six. My heartbeat sped up. I slowly got out of my bed, walked towards the bedroom door. I always keep it locked, even though I live alone. It's, it's like an OCD thing. I stood by the door and listened. Someone was definitely walking around my house. Three people, in fact, I, I, I can count. Uh, they, they were saying things I, I couldn't understand. They were too quiet. My breathing was becoming shallow, and my body was getting hot. I could feel my own temperature slightly rising. Manny whispered, told you. I just stared at him, and he took a step back. That had never happened before. Some switch inside flipped, and the bastards smiled at me. I just kept listening to what was happening outside the room. The pallid bastard opened up a closet and pulled out my two baseball bats before telling me to pick one. He knew what was going on through my head. He knew exactly what I was going to do. I took one of my bats, the uh, black one felt nice in my hand. Manny vanished. I cranked my neck, and the door handle twisted. The door to my room swung open. Before me stood a literal mannequin. I could almost hear something snap inside. It didn't expect me to be awake. <laughs> I moved swiftly, expertly, nearly taking off its head with the bat. The sound of cracking thick plastic boomed in my ears. The mannequin collapsed to the floor. I went out into the hall. Another mannequin stood with its back to me, this one white. I think there was something attached to its plastic head. I took a swing to its back. It bent in half before collapsing on all fours. A second hit to the back of the head. I wasn't moving anymore. <laughs> the third one saw me. A brown one. He ran towards the front door. I followed. It wasn't going to get out just like that. I caught up to it. It started making pleading movements with its arms, the ugly piece of shit. I swung the bat on top of it. I swung once, twice, thrice. I swung over and over again. Even after it was crumpled to the floor with so many parts collapsed on themselves. Once I was done with the third mannequin, Manic Manny uh, popped up again. He spat his poison in my ear again. Tie him up and dump him in the garage for now. I did just that. I wasn't even thinking on my own. I was on autopilot. Good thing the front door was unlocked. The adrenaline wore off quickly. And I, exha I was exhausted once more and completely worn out, man. <laughs> I headed up back to my bed, almost as if nothing had happened. I was pretty docile and relatively calm after that. I passed out on the spot, pretty much. Manny was nowhere in sight, thank God. And I slept like a baby. Waking up this morning, I remembered what had happened the night before, and my mind raced again, forcing me to feel like the world would collapse on top of me if I didn't check the garage. The moment I got out of my bed, cortisol filled my system up once again. 
I no noticed a massive blood stain on the floor. Since when do mannequins bleed? And that was since when do mannequins bleed by bloody spaghetti. <laughs> Oh, well, oh, uh, yes, uh, touching on our previous conversation, Reapers, uh, the Lovecraft story, I just remembered which one it was. It was Dreams in the Witch House, which I have yet to recite. I think I will, um, I don't know if it's a shorter Lovecraft story, but I think I'll definitely do a narration on that uh, after I'm done with this horribly long um, but delightfully bizarre story called the dream quest of unknown Kadath. Because that story is bonkers and I seem to be allergic to doing the editing of it. Alright. <laughs> Going to take a couple more bites. Let's see here. What do we have? Anybody new in the chat? Anyone at all? We have these same people. I hope you're all enjoying. I know nobody's been terribly active. We have the Reapers. Reapers is always active in these chats, and I love it. Thank you for being a guest here, Reapers. All right. Yes, you are very active for one so lacking in life because, well, <clears throat> because of the fact that you are an animated skeleton. And, you know, the Reaper. I have claws. I will use those. There we are. Again. I haven't seen a live human being in far too long. Except when I go to the grocery stores. They are our delightful heroes. Maybe, yeah, uh, the poor folks. The ones down the street, um, they're actually doing really well. They have uh, sanitize, sanitizer wipes uh, for customers and the cashiers. Um, they have designated hours for people to, for the elderly and the immunocompromised to shop in the morning, and they have, uh, plexiglass shields up, uh, between their cashiers and, uh, customers. Which, frankly, having worked that job before, I, I would prefer, I would, I would love to have had a shield between myself and every customer that went through those damn lines. Ooh. Oh, bottom of the cup. Yuck. <clears throat> Wash it down. All right. So, any requests? I, uh, let's see here. 
given the lack of activity, I will just go ahead and pick something again. <clears throat> we have another uh, creepypasta from the um, pasta showcase. Um, oh, and my heathen comment earlier. Uh, one thing I, I'm not terribly thrilled with when it comes to creepypastas. Hello, Nala. How are you? Are um, the ritual pastas. Sometimes they're all right, but for the most part, they just seem nonsensical. Um, like, even as far as uh, those things go. Um, let's see. I just want to see how long this one is. Well, that's not so bad. Uh, it's a little longer than the previous one, but we can do this. <clears throat> All right. Is the monkey's paw available to read? I think Mary Shelley wrote it. I'm not certain how long it is. I don't believe Mary Shelley wrote it. Um, the monkey's paw, if I recall, is a little... Uh, let me see here. Uh, oh, come on. W. W. Jacobs is the uh, author of that one. Uh, let's see here. In fact, it might actually be on. Oof, God. One of the things I like about. There we go. William Wymark Jacobs. Written in 1901. Uh, let's see here. That is a lengthy one. Maybe after this story. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how I'm feeling. <clears throat> Said I'd go until either midnight or I get uh, sick and tired of all this. <laughs> uh, so that is what I'm going to stick to. Um, so this one is called There's an Outbreak Within My Town by Phoenix Emberley. Never read this one before, so it's another adventure. It is technically a short story. It's just a, a longer short story. There is also a lot of dialogue in the beginning. Um, but we'll see. Like I said, we'll see if I'm feeling froggy after this. Um, with this one clawing up my, the back of my chair, I might um, read The Cats of Ulthar after I am done with this one. That's another favorite cat one. All right. Let's see here. No. Bad Reaper. Don't make me get a dog. There's an outbreak within my town. By Phoenix Ember. There's a quaint little town somewhere in the distance, almost isolated from the rest of civilization. It's a rather rural place, containing a few hundred people and a small surrounding forest. 
And despite the small size of the area, the streets would always be bustling with folks running errands, working on outdoor projects, and being generally social. Now, those roads are empty. Well, empty of human beings, rather. You see, something has been spreading among us lately. A sickness that has left our community in ruin has fallen upon us, turning the world as we know it on its head. No, not a sickness, but something more. Something none of us could have ever imagined has emerged. Consuming not only our humanity, but the hope we once had as well. When the animals began acting strangely, we initially tried our best to pass it off as nothing. Uh, we would catch the deer peering at us from the foliage, and they never blinked. All they did was keep their eyes on anyone who passed by, tracking their every movement. When I found myself close to the woods, I noticed several eyes glued to me. As I cautiously approached them, something seemed wrong. They weren't even remotely afraid of me, holding their ground and continuously observing my movements. I stopped in my tracks, taking in the sight of the deer before me. Their bodies were scraped and bruised like something had brutally assaulted them. Their form was almost skeleton-like as a result of malnourishment. Despite their injuries, their f face lacked any sort of emotion at all. It was as if they weren't even aware of their condition. I silently backed away from the deer, their eyes still locked on my every move. Strange confrontations with the animals would progressively grow weirder as time went on. Rather than holding their ground when someone was close by, they would begin to approach uh, the person. At first, their movements were methodical, and their eyes never wavered from their target. Soon enough, however, they grew bolder, and their movements became faster. Some people would awake in the dead of night to find a pair of animals' eyes glaring at them through the window. Their faces would be pressed against the glass, breathing heavily on the clear surface. During these stages, their bodies were even thinner, their wounds more profound, and their eyes far wider than before. Their faces, which had once been ripe with life, now appeared sunken. Their skin was stuck against the bone underneath. I remember the first attack. Someone had gotten too close to one of the deer. His cries were heard, but help had not arrived in nearly enough time. When we found him... We saw the deer standing over his body, looking down at his corpse. A thick pool of liquid covered the man. It had a yellowish and black color, which appeared to be a mixture of mucus and vomit. We witnessed the liquid, which we would later coin as the contagion, sliver into the man's mouth, seemingly moving on its own. And the deer noticed our presence and looked at us. We could see the deer's ribcage now, the bones protruding from its skin. The patches of fur on its back and stomach were messy and soaked with blood. Several people passing by stopped and took notice of what had happened. Some screamed with terror, while others gagged at the ghastly sight. I covered my mouth with my hands, attempting not to get sick at the vomit-inducing scene before me. Everyone winced as the deer took a step towards us, uh, and then another. 
Then it dropped to the ground. Dead. The two bodies were soon surrounded by the morbidly curious spectators, everyone either whispering or, or calling for help. A small town had never witnessed such a grisly sight, and we had an extremely small law enforcement presence since, well, nothing ever happened here. I looked at the man once more, his mouth hung open, his eyes nearly bulging out of their sockets. His body had been beaten and bruised, and his clothes had been torn from several bites he had received. The mix of whispers and shouts all ceased as we took notice of a woman behind us. She didn't say a single word. Instead, she simply pointed toward the forest, and our heads swiveled around to face the woods. Dozens of pairs of eyes could be seen from beyond the underbrush. Everyone fell silent, but only for a moment. My ears were once more pierced by the shill shrieks produced from the crowd as the deer erupted from the f bushes and sprang towards us, moving impossibly fast given their physical state. We all frantically sprinted in the opposite direction, shoving past one another and making their ways towards their homes. I saw the deer pounce onto my neighbors and stomp down on their chests, snapping bone and tearing open their victim's flesh with their teeth. The cries of those who were being attacked were quickly stifled by the deer crushing their throats with their hefty hooves. I tried my best to keep my vision away from the hordes of monstrous animals attacking the people around me. I could hear heavy heaving as the deer projectile vomited the contagion into the orifices of its victims. And the sound of screaming began to fade as the sickly animals caught up with us. Most of our town was infected that day. A few police officers fired round after round at the deer, but to no avail. I do my best to suppress the memories of the outbreak. To remember them is to bring forth such a heavy dosage of anxiety that my entire body quakes with terror. The human bodies that littered the streets wouldn't stay deceased for long. I saw them lift themselves up from the pavement and stretch their limbs. They stumbled around for a while before becoming stable and walking around town. When the infected are reanimated, they act almost normally. They converse with one another, and they're able to function properly despite their injuries. Uh, others even made phone calls to what I assumed was their friends and family. The point was null, though. After all, who would ever believe what was happening in this town? certainly nobody sensible, be it family or the police. As the days passed by and the survivors' resources ran low, some brave folks attempted to sneak through the town and to the stores to gather supplies. The infected wouldn't even attempt to give chase to the looters. Instead, they stared at them with their cold dead eyes. Disturbingly enough, it seemed like the infected were completely aware of what was happening. They could be heard sobbing at times. Some even crumpled to the ground and angrily pounded their fists uh, into the ground until their fingers bent backwards and their hands tore open. 
They showed no reaction to the pain, however, instead their lack of feelings sent them into a further rampage. Before they could injure themselves more, they stopped. They sat there motionless for a f several minutes as something took control of their actions and prevented them from sustaining greater damage. I also saw the infected lose control of their movements as they attempted to exit the town. Something was keeping them there, and something was preserving their bodies as well. A few days quietly passed, and the infected remained dormant and harmless. Their bodies grew malnourished, regardless of how much they ate. I felt sorry for them in that regard. My body was growing thin as well, and I had been quickly running out of food. They were having their energy drained. Something which was evident considering their sunken faces and colorless skin. Those who attempted suicide found it a fruitless effort. They simply wouldn't die, and their actions were halted by what was keeping them alive. It was the contagion. I remembered how it slivered into their mouths and uh, of the infected. It, it moved on its own as if it had a mind, some sort of primitive desire to remain alive. The infected, no matter how much food they consumed, grew thinner every day. The contagion was draining them of their energy until it was forced to move on to a new host. That's why it was keeping them around. So it could take over their bodies and spread themselves further. It's why the infected were allowed control over their actions, unless they attempted to harm themselves or leave town. The infected who chowed down on every last morsel they could would only serve to sustain the infected even longer. They needed to feed, and they knew they had to be transmitted one way or another. I suppose they simply wanted to make their meals last as long as they could. The infected appeared as drained as possible now, and although they couldn't feel themselves degrading, I could tell they understood what was happening to them. They didn't even talk, walk around town or talk with each other anymore. They simply sat down and stared into the ground. They were hopeless and fearful, and many of them bawling their eyes out for hours on end, filling the air with their distraught howls. Most of all, they felt helpless to stop what they knew would soon be happening, and they understood that ultimately, they no longer had free will. Tonight was an especially, an especially grim darkness cloaked the town, and the looters snuck out of their houses once more. I didn't see the survivors, but as I witnessed the infected rise from the ground, I knew they were out in the streets once more. They saw the survivors, and they all turned their heads in their direction. Upon spotting the, main, the remaining survivors, they began treading toward them, slowly at first, then picking up speed. Soon enough, their pace quickened to a full-on sprint, rushing the survivors as fast as they could. They were no longer my neighbors. The contagion was in control now. And it was starving. I refused to look towards the carnage. I didn't want to be reminded of those memories I so desperately wish to forget. I don't want to face this reality anymore. I just want to waste away alone. 
and all I felt was complete despair. The bleakness of my situation infected me more than any contagion could have ever hoped to. There was no reason to even try anymore. Although I blinded myself from the assault carried out by the infected, my ears were flooded by the sounds of the shrieks of pain and the snapping of limbs. I pressed my hands against my ears so tightly that my knuckles turned white and my fingers trembled. The sound of vomit soon overrode the screams, and I knew exactly what was happening. A new batch of infected was being produced. I heard the infected trying to bust down the doors of other houses in search of survivors, and I fell to the ground and cried out in agony. My head felt as light as a feather and my mind went fuzzy. The world had gone to hell. Watching this happen with humans is different than seeing it occur to animals. They're used as food for these creatures, and then, when their usefulness is at an end, they are dispatched with haste. I kept trying to ignore the hellscape outside. I could hear footsteps faintly approach the house I'd barricaded myself inside of. Was it an infected? Now here I sit staring blankly at the growing computer, glowing computer screen in front of me. I'm surrounded by empty wrappers and food cans spread around the room, and I'm unsure of what is to come. The footsteps grew nearer, and then I heard pounding on my door. I don't think I have much time left, so I'll have to wrap this up with haste. Soon there will be more no more survivors left in this wasteland. As the contagion realizes this, they will grow famished. I suppose they'll try and spread out in an attempt to find more hosts to feed off. They're fast and strong, and damaging them won't slow them down unless you destroy them completely. The banging on the door is getting louder. Whatever is on the outside is getting through. There's no reason for me to run from this reality anymore. The door will come down at any second, and with it will come my demise. I've got... Someone broke through. A young man ran into the house and produced a petrified look upon observing me. It was a survivor, and he ran upstairs and out of view. I can feel the memories rushing back to me from the outbreak. Memories which hold the truth within them. A truth which I have long since attempted to deny. As my bony fingers tap against the keyboard, I feel my mind begin to fade away. I can't run away now, and soon I will be no more. A foul liquid is working its way up my throat. I don't have much time left. It neither does the young man inside my home. I get up from my seat, and I look down upon my thrin frame with dismay. I think it is time for me to go. I feel hungry. The end. Well, that was topical. Topical to Reaper's last message in the chat. Topical to the quarantine. a slightly different take on zombies.
I liked it. Hmm. It is almost 10 of the clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. As such, let me wrap this up here pretty soon. Let's see here. I did say I would do the cat's Ulthar. And that is a favorite. It's not terribly long. Actually, fairly short. So, page 88. It's <sighs> mm -hmm. a one page. yarn, as one might say. This is the... Ah, uh, yes. Very well. This will be the last one. It is a relatively short... It is only three pages long. This is the Cats of Ulthar. By H.P. Lovecraft. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river sky, no man may kill a cat. And this I can verily believe as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring beside the fire. For the cat is cryptic and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egyptus, and bearer of tales from forgotten cities in Moreau and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle's lords, and heir to the secrets of hoary and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin, and he speaks her language. But he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which she hath forgotten. In Ulthar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife, who delighted to trap and slay cats of their neighborhood. Why they did this, I do not know. Save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night and take it ill that cats should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight, but whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near their, to their hovel. And from some of the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife because of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden under the spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much of the owners of cats hated these odd folks. They feared them more... Sorry. In truth, much as the owners of cats hated these odd folks, they feared them more. And instead of berating them as brutal assassins, they merely took care that to no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. When, through some unavoidable oversight, a cat was missed, and, so <clears throat> and sounds heard after dark, the loser would lament imp impotently, or console himself by thanking fate that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Arthar were simple, 
and knew not whence it is all cats first came. Hmm. One day, a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow cobbled streets of Ulthar. Dark wanderers they were, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year, in the marketplace they sold fortunes for silver and bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of the wanderers none could tell, but it was seen that they were not that they were given to strange prayers, and that they had painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies and the heads of cats, hawks, rams, and lions. And the leader of the caravans wore a headdress with two horns, and a curious disc betwixt the horns. There was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow. And when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy whom the dark people called Menes smiled more often than he wept as he sat playing with his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulthar, Menas could not find his kitten, and as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation, and finally to prayer. He stretched out his arms toward the sun, and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand, though indeed the villagers did not try very hard to understand. Since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the little boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead the shadowy nebulous figures of exotic things, of hybrid creatures crowned with horns, flank with horn-flanked discs. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night, the wanderers left Ulthar and were never seen again, and the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth the familiar cat had vanished, cats large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow, and white. Old Cranon, the Burgomaster, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for killing for the killing of Menez's kitten, and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, a lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect, for their hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple, even when little at all the innkeeper's son vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in performance of some unheard-of rite of beasts. The village did not know how much to believe from so small a boy, and though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, they preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So Ulthar went to sleep in vain anger, and when the people awaked at dawn, behold, Every cat was back at his accustomed hearth, 
large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow, and white, none was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair and marveled not a little. Old Crannon again insisted that it was the dark folk who had taken them, since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife, but all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat or drink their saucers of milk was exceedingly curious. And for two whole days the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food, but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked that no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week, the burgomaster decided to overcome his fears and call at the strangely silent dwelling as a matter of duty though in so doing he was careful to take with him Shang the blacksmith and Thule the cutter of stone as witnesses. And when they had broke, broken down the frail door, they found only this. Two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and a number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the burgesses of Ulthar. Zath, the coroner, disputed at length with Nith, the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thule were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atal, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned and given a sweetmeat as a reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of small Menes and his black kitten, of the prayer of Menes, and of the sky during that prayer, of the doings of the cats on the night the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. And in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law which is told of by traders in Hathig and discussed by travelers in Nier, namely, that in Ulthar no man may kill a cat. That is that, said the cat with a hat on his head. After all, it is late, and time for some of you to go to bed. I'm going to call that the end of this stream. Thank you all for attending. So, good night, my creepy kitties. And, of course, pleasant dreams. <laughs> Yes, no devouring cats in Ulthar, or anywhere, Reapers. Besides, your bony hands are probably terrible at getting rid of the fur. Good night, everyone. Pleasant dreams.